Good morning. How about this? Uh, let me get this up here. Um, welcome, 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 welcome. I am absolutely loving this. It feels like uh, five minutes since we were last here last year. How many of you were here last year? Okay, about half of you, Rob. There's a lot of new people as well, so um, I'm very, very happy to see that. And um, I have a weird sort of a, a talk this morning because oh, I, I had 10 things to prepare for this week. It's a very busy week. It's like the big Moodle week. There's like a lot of things and a lot of things were happening at work and home and everything and I just kept throwing things into the keynote. I was going, oh, I'll probably, I should talk about that in the keynote. I'll talk about that in the keynote. So I've thrown it all in there and well, let's see how it goes. Um, First of all, though, I have a very, very, very urgent uh, cyber security announcement uh, that I needed to make. Um, never, ever use beef stew as your admin password on a Moodle site. It's just not strong enough. Sorry, I had to get that dead joking. Dad joking. Um, now, um, uh, with this moot, uh, we have uh, honestly the biggest, best moot. In terms of people, we got a little bit less. I think we had a, a lot of people who came after the pandemic. Um, but look, it's a full house here. Um, but the, look at the place. Look at the branding. Look at the, the job that the, the, the uh, conference team have done. I think it's like the best conference, the most sharpest looking conference we've ever had. Would you agree? So um, enjoy. And uh, we, we're going to get into it. There's one thing I do need to do before we get started, because right now I'm looking at you like this. Uh, today is International Talk Like a Pirate Day. I, I do need a, a big yar from everybody. One, two, three. Yarr! I can't hear you. Yarr! There we go. So we've done that bit today. Good. Enjoy. Feel free to keep that up for the day. Now, speaking of hats, uh, last year, uh, this was the t-shirt that I actually designed this image uh, last year for the t-shirt. The um, and I talked a lot about AI, and it won't be much different than today. Um, I also made this t-shirt, which we never actually made as a t-shirt, but I would still love to. Um, and that, that was actually generated from the word Moodle, and it just, an AI turned it into that. Um, and also, uh, last year I also showed um, how you could generate assignments using AI. Um, and you may remember we did some images on the fly. Uh, we had some people yelling out some words and I took Santa and bread and we made Santa holding some bread. Um, you know, this year you can really make a much nicer looking Santa with bread. Um, and look, even better than that, if this loads, you can animate, make videos these days, right? That's a bit cursed. But um, that's ju just to show the improvement in, in a year, what's been happening. All right, Santa, go away. Uh, so very recently, Richard Sampson, who's here somewhere at the MUA, said, uh, look, you were talking a lot about AI last year, and we were wondering what had happened to you. Um, why weren't you talking about Moodle? Have you lost touch? And, of course, uh, a few months after that, uh, everybody got hit by the, the chat GPT fever and uh, has been re-evaluating um, uh, everything. So my, my role in general uh, at Moodle and in what I try and do generally is to just try and look forward as far as I possibly can to try and chart the way forward. Um, this is a, a very weird photo of me back from when I started Moodle uh, and I was making a lot of noise back in the 1990s about how the internet was going to change education a, a lot and that's when I started working on, on Moodle and, and look, look here we are. Um, yeah, I used to have quite long hair back then. Um, it's it's going to get crazier than that. This is me now saying AI is bigger than the internet in terms of its effect on society. The internet connected uh, 
it connected us. It, it's all about information, it's all about access and services and you know, I can literally run a company off this device and so, so can you all. Um, but AI changes how we handle information, it changes how work is done and how we play and it changes most science and technology is going to be transformed. Which means it changes how and why we educate and it's going to change education technology. So it's very, very relevant to us as uh, with our interest in education technology and education in general to, to be looking at how we use AI and I'm going to give you some thoughts uh, today about where I'm at on that topic. Um, what's different to the internet is that AI thinks like we do. We have literally built brains and right now we are on the very beginning of an exponential curve and already they're doing things that will amaze us but that curve has seemingly no limit at this point. Um, it will do anything that people can do and I mean almost anything people can do. Uh, here is some, a few screenshots of some of the tools that are exploding everywhere right now. So here are some, uh, you know, some top 100 tools from, from some random website that I found. Lots and lots of startups and little brands going on here. Here's a bunch of tools. You probably can't read them, but it doesn't really matter. There's hundreds of tools that are coming out just around marketing, for example, to help marketing in many, many aspects. There's here are a whole lot of AI based tools in music, for generating music, handling music, producing, distributing music, all sorts of things. Uh, this is a quite useful site called Future Tools and uh, you know here's just a few random things that have been added in the past 24 hours um, and that, that page goes down. You know there are just tools coming out daily and you've, you've probably seen them but if you weren't aware it's crazy out there and it's, it's, and it's hard to know what to, what to use or what to pick or, or what to do. Um, now uh, I'll say a lot of those tools are actually very simple to make because they're using uh, a big language model like the one from OpenAI and there's an API they can connect to and so their website just basically adds a few prompts calls the big AI, gets some results and you know, shows it to you in a different way. And people are finding very creative ways to build things just on top of that. And just the explosion of creativity around that model has been amazing. Um, I do not think that's how we should run the world, however. It's just kind of a useful thing to do now. So I, I toyed with like generating this, uh, this whole keynote with AI. Uh, the first attempt I did, I used some, one of those slide AI generator tools. Has anybody tried one of those slide generating tools? A couple of people. Um, so there are some of those startups have said, oh, you know, here, oh, we'll generate your slides for you. And you type in a prompt and bang, it gives you a whole bunch of slides with pictures and everything. I'm not even going to show it to you because it was bland as heck. Um, and it's because they don't know enough of the context and really, I mean it was, uh, for certain things they would be useful if you've got a very small presentation about something, um, but it was still a bit bland. Like it was competent but it was not interesting. Um, my second take, I used a two paragraph prompt where I jumped a, dumped a whole lot of ideas into ChatGPT. I generated, and I actually said because because I've been around for a while, this is an advantage of being around for a while, um, most of the stuff I've ever put on the internet is in ChatGPT. It's part of the training data. Actually, if you look on my, uh, on my own personal website, you'll see a biography that I generated, my whole biography. And I, got, I actually used Claude, uh, another AI, to generate my biography. I said, write Martin Dugiamis' biography and pff, pages of stuff. It was probably... 80% correct, I would say, which isn't bad, it was a good start. I fixed the errors and I put it on my website and I said, great, good. Um, but for this I said, okay, generate a keynote for Martin Dugan, it's from Moodle and uh, you know, I had a fairly passable keynote. Like if I didn't really care too much about you, you know, I could have got up here and delivered that and you probably would have gone, yeah, great keynote and gone to coffee and you know, I 
probably could have. I chose not to do that because what I'm, really, what I'm really appreciating, the more I'm using AI, and I'm using it all day, every day, is how much I appreciate the, the education of people, the voice of people, and the intent of people. Like, I want to I know what's behind the words. And so I appreciate all of us more than ever, and I think education is more of an exciting topic than ever. Um, so the third attempt at doing the keynote, which is what we're looking at here, is I did it like this. So I use Obsidian for my notes. Anybody here? Any Obsidian users? A couple? It's a great tool, open source tool. Uh, it stores all your notes um, uh, in text files, and, you, and it's really a very good tool. Um, I take notes. When I have a little ideas, I chuck them into Obsidian. I use a, a Whisper plugin. Whisper is an AI voice transcription, and it's really about the best thing you can get in the world for transcribing voice to text. Um, so I dump all my notes into this thing. I took all the notes. I had a sort of a rough order, but I, I used Claude. Claude, I prefer over ChatGPT sometimes because it has a larger context window. You can use bigger amounts of text. I asked it to help sort my presentation into a nice order. Uh, then I used um, ChatGPT with a, something called the Professor Synapse prompt. You can Google, go search for that. Um, it's a very interesting uh, custom instruction for ChatGPT that makes it much more, um, it guides you. It asks you more prompts and questions to help it do better. And, and it generated me a sequence of slides with picture suggestions and text that I then created in a slide deck myself manually with some images, so I used Midjourney. And then I tweaked it, and I kept tweaking it, and I probably ended up with, I'd say probably 60% of that ended up in here, and I've sort of added on. So that's a kind of a typical way of using AI these days. It's more like working with a team member than a magic answer machine. I, I hope you're, you, a lot of you, some of you nodding, and I, I think AI is a very useful partner um, in, in working, as it is now, for sure. So what, what, are our, uh, what are our trajectories? And if you look around, I'm just seeing so much science fiction that from the last decade or so, about to come true, or starting to come true. Um, you know, we're already walking around with these supercomputers. That's, we're used to that now for the past 10, 20 years. But um, what's happening, AI has accelerated so many of these things that looked far away. And let me show you some of the things that, are, that, are, that I'm, I'm seeing. There is an exponential growth in raw power of AI. This, uh, this is a slide uh, from a friend of mine, Alan Thompson, uh, who uh, has a really good, um, really good source of news about AI. I recommend him. Um, and he's got some predictions here about the, the very next generation of AIs that are coming. So Google has something called Gemini that's coming. Um, and there's another one that I was going to say, and I can't remember, the blanked on it right now, but there's a, a, well, there's a couple. But they have, um, for example, you can see there, like if you just look at how many books they've read in terms of training, it goes from 4 million up to like 40 million huge increase in training data, um, huge increase in, in working memory, um, and a long-term memory of 2.8 petabytes. These are very, very large numbers. And the other exciting thing about it is that they're designed to be multimodal, which means they handle text, images, and video all at the same time. And they're able to transform things between and, and kind of express and talk and listen and, and communicate in all these modes, a bit, even more like we do. And remember, we're still at the bottom of an ex exponential curve. We're, we're still down here. We're, there's a long way to go here as things grow. I do want to stress, though, it's not all about scale and size. Uh, there's a really huge role for lots and lots of small AIs as well, but we'll get to that. Uh, and this is what I was saying before about the task specialization. Many of the tools now are piggybacking on these large, large models, 
Now that's very easy to do, it's very easy to use, you can get started and use it straight away, but you are subject to the errors of that model. You will have whatever training data was used, you're going to have those biases of that training data, you're going to have um, all the features of that bigger model. What we are going to see, I think, is more and more very small AIs that are very specialised for very particular tasks. And I haven't got the demo on the screen here, but I've shown it to a few people. On this phone, which is two years old, um, I have a three gigabyte model that's just trained on medical data. And that model, called Dr. GPT, can pass the medical board exam in the US. So it's like a general practitioner doctor. And you can ask it, you can give it uh, uh, some of your symptoms and it'll start diagnosing your issues. And it's like having a doctor on your phone. And it's sitting completely on this little phone. There's no open AI, there's no big system, you don't need internet. And that's possible now. So we don't need to wait around for the very big companies to decide how all this works. So, and, and that actually makes sense. I don't need my doctor to write me a poem about cats in the voice of Shakespeare. Right? We, don't, we don't need that. We just need things to do their job. The, something that everyone is working on, it's kind of a missing piece, is the ability to create long-term memory. You may have noticed if you're using AIs these days that um, you have a conversation with it and then it starts forgetting the beginning of the conversation and you have to keep it on track. Yeah. Well, it's a bit like us, you know, we also forget. We're, for, forgetting is part of being human, but hopefully we can fix that. And we, we are able to fix that. Uh, there are tons of research and t lots of people working on um, that. And these improvements are going to all be happening in very, very short-term future. Um, and that's because, like us, we also have a long-term memory and a short-term memory. We have, we are trained with training data for our whole life. Uh, just right now, think of, let me ask you a question actually. Um, how many dogs have you seen this year? Right? Now, I can ask you that, it's a pretty weird question, but you probably can roughly come up with a number. Now, what was counting that number? Do you have a dog counting thing in your head? Um, did, you, did you literally parse your entire history for the year and find all the dogs in it in that time? Um, it's, it's a, a very, it, the way our brains work is so interesting and the way we learn and the way we remember things is so interesting and, I, and, I, and I, what I'm noticing is a lot of parallels and I'm, a, lot of, a lot of people are trying to say AI is replicating what we're doing. It's not exactly replicating what we're doing but it's replicating it close enough that you can start talking about things like short and long term memory in, in, with similar language. Um, what we do when we sleep is all of our very short term memory, our very, you know, what happened today and this morning it sits around in a short-term memory and we slowly consolidate that into our long-term memory and we store the most important features, you know, things we saw and stuff we, people we talked to and, and words that were said and stuff we, um, we heard. Um, and that's what needs to happen with AI. AI needs to develop that ability to start remembering everything, I think. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, education has a lot to bring here. A lot of our education knowledge is now, we can now apply it to machines because we're making, we're educating our machines. This is another trend. We're still talking about some of the trends that are happening and uh, towards the sci-fi future. Uh, has anybody here tried Open Interpreter? No one. All right, let me show you something. Now, this is probably going to go bad, but let's do it anyway. So this is a quite cutting edge um, thing. This has only really been available in the last couple of weeks. Um, a lot of people have been working towards this, but uh, this, this is a little bit uh, very interesting. So what I have on here is a system called Open Interpreter. It's all open source uh, that is sitting here on my Mac. And it's an AI that has access to my whole computer. 
And you can ask it pretty much anything. I could say, uh, you know, turn on dark mode. Oops, I spelt it wrong, but let's see how it manages. Oh, no problem. So a very simple example to start with. It's writing some Apple script, ch change my computer to dark mode. Um, done. OK, so let's, let's do something a little more complex. Let's say, um, and I, I had some, so many examples. The problem with this, it's so broad, I kept coming up with new examples and I couldn't decide what to do. Um, so let's, I'm just going to do a simple one here. Let's say, um, hey? Pack up the. What? Yeah, yeah, I should back up the computer before I do this, but that's not how I work. <laughs> I live on the edge, my friend. A lot of you don't know that in the early days of Moodle, I used to write Moodle code directly on Moodle.org live and then hit save and quickly check was it still working and then check it into, into, the, into the repository after that. That is the worst possible practice, never do that. <laughs> but I tell you what, the adrenaline rush is awesome. Uh, okay, generate a list of, let's say, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short because I, this, I've got a limited keynote time here. Let's say 50 random words and put it in a LibreOffice document and then open the document. So it's, you can't read this, I'll read it out to you. So it's, it's coming up with a work plan to generate a list of 50 random words and do blah blah. We're going to generate the words using Python. We're going to save the list to a text file. We're going to open the text file in LibreOffice, save the document in LibreOffice format, open the LibreOffice document. Okay, has an error went in the Python. He goes, okay, I had an error. I shouldn't run it that way. I'm going to run it a different way. So it's recovery. It's downloaded something in Python called random word. Now what's amazing about this is it builds on an absolute cornucopia of millions of open source projects that are out there. It's downloading Python libraries and software from the world and it's running it here to get work done. Okay, it had another error. It's not going as well as I hoped, but here we go, it's worked. Here we go, it's generated 150 uh, random words. It's doing a bit more processing. It's put the words in a text file called randomwords.txt. Now let's move to the next step, which is to open it in OpenOffice. It's guessed the S office command. It's going to say I can't find it because uh, I'm on a Mac. So it's going to use Python to create the LibreOffice document. Now it just keeps going. It's installing some more libraries. It's getting the job done. Now uh, every time you do this, it does it a bit differently. <laughs> um, so I couldn't, just, I couldn't actually predict how this demo is going to go. Something else, I'll just tell you about some of the things I have been doing successfully. I, I, I got it to uh, take a video that I had, take the audio out of it, run it through Whisper, generate a subtitle file, put the subtitles back into the video and save it and then open the video with subtitles for me. I got it to go to Moodle.com, get all the news articles, run a sentiment analysis across the news articles and make a table in a LibreOffice file with all of Moodle's news articles and whether they were positive or negative. All right, so here we are, LibreOffice. So anything you can do on your computer, this can also do, pretty much. And it's just an example of an agent working as a team member, right? Just like you work with someone in your team at work and you say, oh, can you do this for me? And they might come back. Hey? We can use it on everything, Guido, we can, everything. So, um, an example, okay. Very exciting stuff. Uh, I would advise you back up your computer before you do that. <laughs> now, another thing I talked about last year as well is augmented reality. Um, if you've seen Apple Vision Pro finally come out, this is the kind of feedback it's been getting. The, 
because they weren't, they didn't constrain themselves to budgets too much, and they just put the absolute cutting edge technology they possibly could into it. The best thing about that was that they proved you can get a very high quality result. So if you've tried VR headsets before, you know they're, they're kind of hard, they're clunky, hard to wear. They're not so the experience isn't awesome. You're not going to wear it all the time. But what we have now is actual proof from a lot of people that, oh my gosh, this just looks like the real world. And there's literally a dial on the headset and you can just turn the real world on and off. Right? So the digital world is, with the, is mixed with the real world. It has 12 cameras sensing everything around you and it just blends the internet and uh, software into your real world. Now it's expensive, so what? I mean, what we're seeing here is it, does, it can exist. So that means as, the, as, in time, as time goes by, the cost will come down and it will get smaller, it will get better, and it will get to something you could wear all the time, a slightly chunky glasses frame. Um, and so, you know, this is from their promotional materials, but what I wanted to say was in that world where, you know, that's not that creative, you're basically having a video conference, I mean, it wouldn't be any different on a screen, honestly, there's no real advantage to that. But if you're walking around and some of these people are actually bots, so you actually have AIs around you, it starts getting very interesting, right? What is society like when we have this real mix of, of real people and AI uh, agents that are able to do amazing things? They're living in our world. Uh, and speaking of living in our world, let's look at robots, actual physical robots. So this is a, a video of a, there's a, a, something called the RoboCup. And um, a lot of people have, uh, robot labs have competitions to make soccer playing robots. And it helps push the state of the art and it's a good target. You know, and you have a tournament and you get a winner every year, you know, who wins the robot. So this was the, the finals last year of robots playing soccer, playing football. Now I'm showing this because it actually looks really lame. It actually looks pretty bad. <laughs> like these are robots that have been programmed right by their by their teams and it's the, they're actually waiting to, to start so I'll jump into the middle somewhere here there we go I mean that that's just <laughs> that's just pathetic right <laughs> that was last year this is the <laughs> that's the final right laughable right robots never gonna never gonna take over the world all right Let's, let's look at something from earlier this year. This is a robot that has a large language model, a current generation AI attached. This was never taught to play soccer, never taught to play football. So this is a Google thing. So simply Simply because they learn through feedback from the environment, they have a goal, which is to score a goal, literally. They're, they're playing as a team. They're uh, developing uh, these abilities to, to play quite effectively. And they're just winning games and playing against each other. So that's in one year. That's the power of the new, uh, new type of AI. There's no programming. And a lot of the training happens in a virtual reality for them. It happens in a software space. You may also have seen uh, other robots like this that can solve the Rubik's Cube with one hand. And they just basically let a robot hand in software practice and practice and practice and practice and then they just put it on a real hardware robot and now it can solve a Rubik's Cube with one hand. But that's the difference. People who run AI labs are very excited about this stuff and saying things like, this is not just replacing human intelligence, they're going to replace labour, work. And a lot of people uh, are talking about this. Um, remember this movie, Bicentennial Man? One of my favourite movies, I, like, I really like this movie. Robin Williams playing a robot who 
an AI essentially, and he starts off as a, as a household robot and uh, he, his intelligence improves and he starts wanting to become uh, recognised as a, as a human. Um, I'm not sure that's the trajectory, but it, it is an example in our sci-fi of how, how robots could be. And these are actual robots that you can buy. They have language models attached to them. They are improving rapidly. Let me show you one. This is a, a new factory, just the first robot factory. This can produce 10,000 humanoid robots a year. And they use their own robots to run the factory. And this is just a quick example of, of what they look like. Uh, I had this, I think I did this bit in a rush this morning. Here we go. You'll see some of them working in a minute, hopefully. There we go. So these robots are already working in factories, doing factory work. Oh, that's a bit too short. Oh, damn it. There we go. Oh, you can see them. There we go. Well, anyway, too much promotional stuff here. But um, I've seen a lot of... I, I, did, I actually added this this morning very quickly, so I didn't get time to put the timestamps in. Um, what, these robots are already working in factories. They're already actually functional. Here we go. There we go. Oh, well, too quick. Uh, now, what I like about them is they are humanoid shape, but they don't look like people. I, I personally, I hate when they make them look like people or try that. It's like, we don't need that. We have people already. Ah, let me get out of here. There we go. I, I don't think robots should look like people. Uh, that's a mistake. Because um, it's always going to look dumb and, and, you know, the worst, all the worst sci-fi, all the dystopian sci-fi has robots that look like people. Why would we do that to ourselves? Now, it makes sense that they're the shape of people because then they can operate people's stuff. And I, I'm personally, I think the robot, we have a few robots at home. I have one that cuts the lawn. I have one that, uh, that we have, a lot of you probably have ones that, that uh, mop the floors. Um, but the one we're looking forward to most, I think, is the one that will cook meals off recipes on the internet and then clean up afterwards. <laughs> Right? The kitchen. The, the kitchen. It's like there's a lot of family worrying about the kitchen. Well, like, imagine if that wasn't a problem anymore. And imagine if it cost, you know, a lot less than a new car um, and you could just have that. Imagine it was just there. Um, that, that seems extremely, not only likely, but like fairly close. Um, another thing I don't have a slide for here is a use case that I'm particularly keen on, which is Imagine a humanoid robot that is parked here in Barcelona and I'm in Perth, Australia and I put on my VR headset and now, and I, now I'm looking out through the eyes of that robot and it takes the AI on board, takes care of all the details of walking and staying upright and I just basically say, oh, go to the Moodle office and say hi to everybody. So I didn't have to fly my whole meat body halfway around the earth. I could literally just drop in for a meeting, hang out, and then disconnect. Um, that, that kind of thing is also very exciting to me. What we're seeing here is a trend towards uh, AI, well, robots and AI being better at some things, cheaper at some things, faster than some things, and also safer than some things. A lot of the autonomous driving, you know, it's not quite there yet where all our cars are driving themselves, but for certain use cases, if you look at the statistics where they've been applied, the accident rate of an autonomous driver is lower than human accident rate. So once you start getting curves that, that make that happen, it's actually probably unethical to let people do that job anymore because they're going to kill people whereas the robot doesn't. So at what point do we go, that's, that's what we want? We, we, you know, this gets really interesting. So I, I think over time, and this may not be so quick, it might take a while, obviously, to go everywhere, but over time, we're going to see a trend of automation taking over more and more jobs. The OECD said 27% of all jobs will probably be gone in five years. That's a pretty big organisation to say that. And that's why, you know, you, you just come, auto, uh, you, in the end, you go, well, we can't have 
a third of all the people in the world on, on the current unemployment benefits, it's not going to work, right? Our whole economy is going to be turned upside down. So we, we do need to start all solving that. We need to start working out some way that you, you can live without having to work because there won't be enough jobs for everybody. And in fact, the whole idea that everybody needs to work to live is just an idea. It's something we've got used to. It's very embedded in our society. It's kind of the, probably the, the smallest unit that is underneath all the economy, but we no longer have that fundamental assumption anymore. If, if, our, if robots and automation are doing all of the work of making society run, we could have a golden age, right? We don't have to work to live. You can just live and you can work when you want to. I mean, that would be ideal, right? Why not, why not shoot for the, the, good, the good way? And people go, well, what, what will we do if we're all living on universal basic income? What will we do? Well, this is Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, very old uh, model. So what we're talking about is your basic needs are taken care of, your physiological needs, you know, food, water, warmth and rest, and your safety needs are taken care of. So you can focus on the rest, right? Relationships, wellness, health, take long hikes, uh, work on science, but in particularly, what I think, what I'd love everyone to do is to start learning. We have more time to learn whatever we want, right? Why, and, and it comes, so now we're getting back to education finally, Martin. Oh my God, I'm really running out of time. Um, why, why will we be learning? What will we be learning in this world? How will we learn? And how can we demonstrate we've learned things? Because that's important. You kind of want to know somebody knows something. Who here feels they've had a great education? Put your hands up. All right, good on you. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Um, keep up your hand if you can read the very latest cutting edge, uh, let's say, physics, paper in physics and understand it. Okay, couple, good on you. Uh, can you also read uh, a really recent paper on, uh, let's say, chemistry and understand it? Uh, do you speak more than 20 languages? Okay, all the hands have gone down. Because, you know, if you think about it, our education is rather patchy. We specialise in very little areas. And, you know, that's okay in a world where everyone works because we all work together on these problems and we get them done. But, like, in terms of have we all had a great education or has the current education system been great for us as individuals, I would argue no. Like, we're not all renaissance individuals that can just know a lot about everything like Leonardo da Vinci or something. We're not Leonardo da Vinci's, right? We're all, we've all gotten specialised and forced into being workers into different jobs. And just by the structure. It's not bad, it's just what we've been doing. I feel like... Has anyone heard of the story Flowers for Algernon? Yeah? It's a really great, it's a short story, it was turned into a longer novel and a movie and so on, but what it is, it's a, a, a person with a very, very low IQ, um, kind of mentally disabled actually, and a scientist experiments on him and a mouse, and uh, increases the IQ by a lot, and the mouse gets very intelligent, solving mazes and things really quickly, and then the, the guy, is, his intelligence increases, and he's keeping a journal, so you can watch his writing going from very simple to... He's, he starts learning everything and he starts taking over the research of this IQ increasing technology. And then he starts taking over his own development through that and then he realises it's going to end and his IQ starts declining and he's nothing he can do about it. And his journal gets simpler and simpler and simpler and he's back to being working in a bakery sweeping the floors again. And it just, it's the best story on education I've ever seen because it really gives you that impression, the, the feeling of what education gives you, right? And, you know, in, in my own family, we have a family member who has not had a great education and, like, absolute lovely person, you know, love her to bits. But you can see the opportunities she's missing because she did not have a high school education. And it's the sort of thing you, you can't imagine easily because it's, you... You can't imagine knowing a, a huge thing when, you, when, you're, when you're constrained by the education you've had. So I think 
we have an opportunity to increase the learning of everybody higher and higher here. And that will help us find solutions to the big problems, the SDGs, um, and help, it, help the world be a better place, which is the mission of Moodle. Um, anyone seen the movie Her? Right? Look at, th th this is what our computers could look like. Oh, sorry, I haven't got the audio here. It's just more that everything just feels disorganized. You mind if I look? That works. Does that work? Does it work? Might not work. Let's see. Ah, oh, well, never mind. We're running out of time. Several thousand emails regarding LA Weekly, but it looks like you haven't worked there in many years. You may remember oh, this scene. Um, I, I think I was just saving those because I thought maybe I wrote something funny in some of them. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, there are some funny ones. If you. I think there are about 86 that we should save. We can delete the rest. So the AI gets access to his computer, just like Open Interpreter did, goes through his mail and says, Oh, I'll start cleaning up your mail, cleaning up your system. No, 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 no. And he's like, ooh, ooh. He, he goes, okay, and it just works, right? Um, it's a very good movie because it shows kind of a possibility of where agents could go. And I just see, it's very prescient, actually. It's from 2013 or something. If you haven't seen it, go and, go and check out that movie. I, I actually think that represents the most likely AI we're going to use. So the most likely AI that, that is going to catch hold and become popular um, will be our own personal assistant that learns everything about us. I, I, I think that AI should listen to this keynote I'm giving now. If it's, it's on this machine, right? My, just like her, it's my little AI. Uh, it's listening to everything I say. It's reading all my mails. It's looking at all my messages. And I would only ever allow that if I could trust it. Trust is all about, it's all about trust. I would never trust that AI to sit on a big service, some company that provided it to me. Never, right? We're in, the, we're in Europe that, that made everybody get into the GDPR, which is amazing. This, this concept of personal privacy is very important. But so it's very hard to trust anything out there, especially with all your life's data. But if an AI was sitting here on your machine, your personal machine, if you could trust it enough to be with you, you have the ability of uh, this AI helping you with your life. Now, I'm very fortunate. I have Liz Carlin, who's sitting here, as an assistant, my, as an assistant at Moodle, who um, assists the whole executive team, but me particularly. And I've experienced what it's like to have a great assistant. So I'm very lucky in my position. A lot of people who are rich, have assistants that do this exact thing for them. You say, oh, I, I want to go to America. Oh, great, I'll book the flights for you. What do you want? No, 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 just arrange it. It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Imagine if everyone had that. Imagine if everyone had that. And imagine that was helping you with your learning as well. And it's important that we don't, we can't, don't separate learning from life here. The, the lifelong assistant uh, needs to be... in. Uh, able to access all parts of your life in order to help you with your education as well. And that's why it needs to be open source and needs to be on your device. And I'll finish up quickly, I've got a couple more. Um, so what about formal learning? What does this mean for all the institutions that you're running here, right? Universities and schools and company learning and, and training and all those things. Well, they still need to exist, but they're probably going to have to evolve. <laughs> the formal learning, I'm just going to call that all formal learning, right? So you go and do a course, I, need, I want to learn a thing. I probably would still love to go to a university to learn that thing. And this is why, because it gives you the feeling of being a professional. So we should be doing uh, uh, more things like simulations like giving you the ability to work in a team on that, in that way already, in, in a place that's safe. So we should also be teaching people how to learn. And not just learn in general, but how to learn for that field. So if that person really wants to get good at art, well, let's teach them how to learn about art. Let's teach, you know, what are the good sources? What are the good, what are the key people in history to look at? What are the... Uh, you know, how do you keep up with the field, or engineering, or, or physics, or whatever? 
We should also be teaching soft skills, EQ and self-management. And I never see enough of that in higher education. My own kids have just gone through university. They didn't get any of that, any of this, actually. They just got, here's a bunch of content, here's a quiz, and pass your unit. And you, you know, I, I don't think universities are running that well because we've just tried to cram too many people into two small little things and we just don't have the ability to have all this personal attention. But EQ and self-management are very important. Realistic project-based learnings and simulations, like I said. Mentoring and apprenticeships. So continuous assessments, people watching what you're doing, giving you immediate feedback, this kind of... Uh, scaffolding and supporting as you learn. Um, and finally, trusted, you know, universities and schools should give you trusted credentials at the end. So if you get a, as we do now, right, you get a certificate or a degree. Um, and I, I think it's important that all of that is human led. We should keep that being human led, not, not allow AIs to get too much into this. Because we need to be in control of our own society and pass these things on. That's what we do, right? We pass on our culture to the next generation. And I feel like this is very, very uh, central. So I see a huge role as we free up some of the other stuff to focus more on that. So openedtech.global is the, a website for open ed tech. And it's a, a new association that now exists. It's in Brussels. Uh, we have... Um, members. Uh, it was founded by myself and uh, Fred from Big Blue Button, who's here. Uh, we are just in the early stages, but we're growing it to be an association of people who want to work on some of the larger scale infrastructure here. How do you get AIs onto people's devices and make sure it's open and trustworthy? Right? These are, these are Moodle problems, but also other, there's a lot of other people in the world who are working on it from different angles, and we need to bring them together, and that's what this is about. So if, you know, I think there's a real possibility here of really truly creating a world of lifelong learners, people who can get the, the, the bug for learning and have the time for learning and have the incentive to, to explore and use our very, very powerful brains that we have to their full potential um, and become a... a uh, Globally, I've had this slide for years, a globally oriented, multiculturally aware, environmentalist, caring, educated, healthy world. Well, we have that ability, and this AI is actually becoming a, a real way we can make that happen. Maybe Moodle has a huge part in making this happen. I really, really hope so. And, uh, and, and we can use the community that we have, and all of you, pushing in your own way, in your own areas, to this kind of goal, we can improve things together and, and try and approach that goal. Uh, very, very quickly, I, mean, a little, I haven't talked about Moodle, you might notice, very much. Um, what we've done recently, we have, we've recently um, worked on, crafted uh, Moodle's AI principles. You can find that on Moodle.com. Um, we're keeping things human-centered in Moodle. We're focusing on transparency configurability, so you're always able to turn things on and off, data protection and privacy, equality, ethical practice and education. And you can read more about that on Moodle.com. I'm also, uh, if you look on Moodle.org, you'll see there's a, a Moodle research course on Moodle.org. And we had a survey earlier this year asking you what you thought we should be doing with AI. There is a second survey out now, that's the URL. Please, if you have time next couple, this week, I'd love it if you went and answered that survey because I really want to hear from you what your opinion is on, on AI, particularly when it relates to Moodle in the short term, the things we should be doing in the next year and two and three. Um, and there's also it's a panel as well later this week about that. There's a lot of talk around this. Uh, so let's all let's kind of think together on these topics. And, you know, come for the survey and stay for the, for the course. There's a forum there where we're chatting about this, these particular issues uh, there. Um, and so the rest of the moot is ahead. We have 100 speakers, 700 of us. I'm looking forward to catching as much of it as I can. Um, there is a Moodle 4.3 session from, uh, with Matt uh, later today. Is it midday, 12, something like that, Matt? Um, there's a HQ roadmap session from our uh, Chief Product Officer here, Marie Ashour. 
Um, there's a music jam tonight. You may not have seen that. You have to register for that separately. There's a free registration on the site. There's only a limit of 200 people can come. We've actually rented an entire nightclub in the middle of town, and there's a stage full of instruments, and we're going to be jamming, just making music, whatever. Um, quite a lot of people already bringing things and coming along, um, uh, so that'll be fun. Tomorrow's keynote with Zakat from UNESCO uh, is be really interesting. Um, she's going to talk about lifelong learning from a UNESCO perspective. And uh, of course, we'll have the best party ever tomorrow night. It will be. I know it will be because we practiced last, yeah, last year already. Um, so enjoy the space, uh, enjoy each other, have a great time. Thank you, thank you very much.